Hello again, you're listening to Journeys to the Ice, the podcast of the Antarctic Research Centre. I'm Matthew Wood. Located at the southernmost edge of the cool temperate zone and at the convergence of major southern ocean water masses, the sub-Antarctic islands of New Zealand and Australia support a diverse ecosystem of insects, marine mammals and countless seabird species, forests of hardy southern rata and grassy tundra strewn with flowering megaherbs. Jody Williams gained a Master of Science in Metamorphic Petrology at the School of Geography, Environment and Earth Sciences at Victoria University. She was recently awarded an Enderby Trust Scholarship to travel to what Christchurch-based Heritage Expeditions describes as the Galapagos of the Southern Ocean. Welcome Jody. thanks for joining us today. So, with regard to your recent trip to the Subantarctic Islands, where exactly did you go and how were you able to get down there? I won a scholarship through the Heritage Foundation to go on a cruise for two weeks down to the Subantarctic Islands. They're a company that does cruises in quite a few areas of the world, like the Subantarctic, down to Antarctica. They also go all the way up to Russia and Siberia and the North Pole. But they're a New Zealand company and they have a scholarship that they give out every year to a couple of 18 to 30 year olds who have an interest in the Subantarctic Islands and they pay for 80% of the fare. And so we have to come up with the, the 20% and you get to go on their tour. We went and saw four islands Three of them come under the New Zealand jurisdiction, Snares, Campbell and Auckland. And then the fourth island, Macquarie, is under Australian jurisdiction. It's mainly bird watching and the history, the landscapes. A lot of ornithologists and ecologists and biologists go on the tour. How did you hear about the scholarship? I just saw a poster up in the tea room, actually, in the geology department called the Galapagos of the Southern Ocean. And you just had to write a 400-word letter about your interest in the area and why you'd like to go down. And I just decided to apply. I really didn't think I had much of a shot because apparently it normally goes to biology and ecology students. And I was 30 hours at the tail end of the scholarship. But I thought it'd be a really fantastic place to go to and just thought, why not, and gave it a shot. And surprisingly, I got it. So you travelled from New Zealand and then between the islands by boat. The distances between some of these islands are fairly significant. How much of your time was spent in transit on the boat and how much time was actually spent on the islands themselves? We were at sea for 12 days and we made six landings, which were normally like an afternoon, so four or five, six hours at a time. So really that's only three days on land and then the rest of the time was at sea, especially when we were heading down to Macquarie Island because that's so far south. It was a two-day journey to get there from Auckland to Macquarie Island and then a two-day journey, again, just solely at sea from Macquarie up to Campbell. So 75% of the time you're at sea. And the boat was comfortable enough? I actually had a really bad experience. Everyone was taking seasickness tablets, but I got really seasick and I spent every minute on the boat in bed. It was actually horrible. But the people who weren't seasick had a great time. Like They were up on deck a lot because all the seabirds, the albatrosses and the petrels follow behind the boat the whole way. So there's always things to see. And there was a bar and you could hang out with the crew and they had lots of lectures. We had a couple of New Zealand's best landscape and wildlife photographers actually with us. They gave quite a few photography sessions and then there were lots of lectures on the different animals, the birds, the plants, the history, so there's always something to do. So these sub-Antarctic islands of New Zealand and Australia, are they currently uninhabited? The only one with a permanent population is Macquarie Island, and that's, I think it's about 1,500 kilometres south of New Zealand. It's halfway between New Zealand and Antarctica. The Tasmanian government have a research station there, and I think they have about 20 to 30 permanent staff who winter over and they normally do a year-long shift. There's also the meteorological station down there which is where this area of the world gets their weather from, the main weather station of the South Pacific, Southern Ocean I guess. Uh, Snares, no one lives there and no one's actually allowed on it except for a very few research scientists but even then it's very controlled because all the birds actually burrow just under the peat 
and apparently the whole island is covered in burrows. So when you're walking around, you're standing in all the burrows and all the eggs and the chicks were getting crushed and dying. So no one's allowed to go on there. So we just went cruising around the shores. The Auckland Islands, they have a few small research stations there, but only like five people at a time studying the sea lion population. Campbell Islands used to have a big base there. The base is still there and it had quite a few scientists and conservation people there. There was actually quite a few people living there in the 90s and the early noughties because they did a huge rat eradication program, but no one's living there either at the moment. What were your overall impressions of the environment down there in terms of the flora, the fauna, landscapes, and also the sunlight hours? Because, of course, you were down there in late December during the austral summer solstice. The sun was setting about 11 o'clock at night and up at four in the morning. In terms of actual landscapes, it looks quite similar to New Zealand, like the west coast of New Zealand. All of the islands, the western coasts are really rugged, with rough cliffs with the westerlies hammering it. And the eastern side, you've got a bit more sheltered bays. But in terms of like the feeling being there, it's just really isolated and it did make you feel just like a tiny little speck in the middle of the ocean. And the islands are quite small. So on Edinburgh Island, which is part of the Auckland Island group, we were able to circumnavigate the island and you had to walk up over the plateau. Quite a few of the British people said it was a lot like the moors in Scotland. And you could see all around the island and you could see you actually were just out in the middle of nowhere. Edinburgh Island was quite cool actually because it had a lot of rata forest. It's just all these really twisted, gnarled tree trunks And you could just imagine goblins and hobbits running around. It looks exactly like Lord of the Rings. We also went and saw a few old whaling stations and graveyards from shipwrecks. It was hard enough getting down there in a, you know, modern icebreaker boat. But imagine going down there 200 years ago in a wooden sailing ship. And even more amazing is that the Māori went down there like 500 years ago on little boats and made it all the way down there. It's pretty out of the way. Why are these islands off by themselves, sticking up above the surface in the middle of a large ocean? Can you explain them in terms of their geologic setting? All four of them are quite geologically different. Snares Island, which is only about 100 kilometres south of Stewart Island, that's just part of an old granite batholith. That's really old, I think it's about 200 million years old. It's really small though, it's like only three kilometres across. And the Auckland Islands, they're also on part of the old granite basement but with volcanic activity on top of that there's a few old crater rims which are forming most of the island and Campbell Island's pretty cool that's got a metamorphic basement so there's lots of schists and then there's also quite a lot of sedimentary sequences of mudstones sandstones and limestones and then also volcanics and they had quite a few big columnar basalt plugs That was pretty awesome to see and it was heavily glaciated. We did actually quite a big walk up to the top of Campbell Island and you could see the U-shaped valleys and some moraines. That was pretty amazing. But the best geologically is Macquarie Island. I think that's off the continental shelf but that's at a plate boundary. It's a World Heritage Site because of the geological setting. It's the only place in the world that you can see a complete undeformed ophiolite sequence above ground. There's a few other places in the world, like in Cyprus and Newfoundland, but they're not completely oceanic. So ophiolite sequence is just a sequence of oceanic rocks. So on the ocean floor, the top layer is made out of pillow lava, which is coming out from under the ground. And there's good examples of that at Red Rocks in Wellington. And then underneath that, you get what's called dolerite dikes, which is an iron-rich magma coming up. And then underneath that further is a whole lot of gabbros and ultramafic rocks, which are the really dense iron-rich rocks. This goes a couple kilometres underground, and you find it all over the world in oceanic crust. But because it's so deep, it's not normally exposed at the surface of the earth. And when it is, it's normally being deformed over time, or it's not a complete sequence. But at Macquarie Island, you do have the actual complete sequence of all the different rock types exposed at the surface. So walking around Macquarie Island you could see just all these amazing pillow lavas. The actual proper ophiolite sequence is further inland so we didn't get to see it but they did have rock samples on display. It's really young, it's only about 700,000 years old but it represents rocks from up to six kilometres below the crust. It was originally a spreading ridge but then it was uplifted 
It's just this little strip of land in the middle of a very deep ocean by the trench that's being thrust up. I'm assuming that with a name like the Galapagos of the Southern Ocean, it's really the wildlife that's the biggest drawing card of this trip. The wildlife was amazing. It was mainly seabirds and all the mammals are sea mammals. The southern royal albatross has a three metre wingspan and you could get to within a metre of it. We saw a whole lot of different types of penguins. On Macquarie Island we saw king penguins, which are kind of the shorter version of the emperor penguins with the yellow and orange necks. You could go into this middle of this colony with 10,000 birds and you'd just sit down and they'd all come up and stand around you and just chatter away and nibble at your gumboots. My favourite would have been the elephant seals on Macquarie Island. You know that elephant seals are really big, but it's not till you're actually there you realise how big they were. The adult males are up to six metres long and four tonnes, and you just can't fathom how big they are. The babies and the teenagers are three metres long, and they just rise up on their shoulders and they're taller than you. To what extent has this ecosystem been damaged by human activities in the past? And how successful have recent conservation efforts been in restoring and protecting it? The islands have a horrible history of sealing and whaling. It's where they were getting all the oils from before, mineral oil. And also the other biggest thing is the pests that they introduced. There's goats, rats, pigs, cats, mice, cattle, sheep, and they've decimated the populations on lots of the islands. One of the things I was most impressed with going down on the trip was the conservation efforts people are making today. On Campbell Island, they did a huge rat eradication program and were completely successful, got rid of every rat, and it's the biggest island in the world to have rat eradication to date. And that caused several species to come back that they thought were extinct. The Campbell Island snipe, was discovered and it's the first new species of bird to be discovered in 100 years in New Zealand and also the world's rarest duck, the Campbell Island teal, came back and it's just really nice to know what human involvement did back then and to know you can come full circle and really make a difference. I know that you're someone who's already seen quite a bit of the world but an educational trip such as this one must have been quite a change from your usual notion of overseas travel. It was really different because you were aware that you were going down to a place that hardly anyone goes to and most people don't get the opportunity to go to. That's one of the main reasons why the Heritage Expeditions have set up the scholarship is for younger people to go down to the islands because it's actually a really expensive trip. So the majority of people on board are near retirement age and quite well off. Also another part of giving the scholarship was they kind of wanted the young people to be ambassadors to try and spread the word about the islands, because not many people know about them, and also really push the whole conservation side of things that you do have to look after these areas. Well, thanks very much for doing your part as an ambassador for the Subantarctic Islands today, and all the best for your future travels. Thanks for having me. For more journeys to the ice, visit cyblogs.co.nz forward slash journeys to the ice.